So today we're going to look at some of the underlying science in what you've seen in some of the episodes in the original series, Next Generation DS9, Voyager, and uh, Enterprise. So, <clears throat> you obviously have noticed this when you've been watching Star Trek. <laughs> they all speak English. I mean, there's no French aliens out there. Or German. They all speak English, and, and there's a lot of them. I mean, here I've listed over 200 specific life forms, and of the ones that do speak, it's, it's all English. But 16G could be fatal. 5G, you're going to lose consciousness, and this was a problem with fighter pilots in the early days before they developed the suits to help them. A very sharp turn in a jet fighter, and you're unconscious and then you're into a crash dive. Now remember, we need to travel that distance in 22 hours, so our acceleration is going to be pretty high. How high? Well, that's the g-force you need to get to <laughs> to get to that speed in an hour. So the crew of the Starship Enterprise are little blobs of red material dotted around the, the ship. But they thought of this. And that is the inertial damper. This is a cosmic shock, shock absorber. Um, we don't really know how it works. It might be an internal gravitational field, and of course we don't really know what gravity is, so... Okay, let's go through this paradox. What happens if you go back in time and kill your mother before you were born? <laughs> you cease to exist, of course, because you weren't born because you killed your mother. But if you cease to exist, you couldn't have gone back in time to do it, did you? <laughs> And if you didn't kill your mother, then you haven't ceased to exist. So we have to now, the way you can get round this, and there is a way you can get round this, is you can go back in time, kill your mother, and then you start up another time stream. So now we've created an alternate reality. And that is one way you can get round this paradox. Acceleration. Again. Splat! <laughs> oh dear. Those compensators didn't come on in time. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, you can't see this as clearly as I would like you to. Warp factor one is, is, is here. This is warp factor one. That's the speed of light. And they did recognize some, some problems here. Uh, if you're traveling to a nearby galaxy, which is in this column here, uh, even at the maximum warp, which is 9.9, .9, which is impossible in the Star Trek universe, it's taking you 655 years to do it. These are the speeds of the starships up here. Uh, there's the early Enterprise, maximum speed warp 9.2. There's the D-class, uh, maximum speed 9.6. If you were traveling at 9.6, which is buried under replacement, replace the lamp. Let's hope the lamp doesn't go. It's going to take you a thousand years to get to a nearby galaxy. This is probably one of the most famous expressions. Beam me up, Scotty. Someone came up to me the other day when we were talking about this presentation and said the reason this was invented in Star Trek is because they didn't have the shuttle ready. <laughs> okay, would a transporter work? Let's talk about it. What does it do? Does it just send atoms? Or does it send the atoms and bits of information? Or does it just send the bits of information, which is where the atom is, what it is, what it's joined to, and so on and so forth. There was one episode where Kirk is duplicated, and he's up here. There's angry Kirk and there's passive Kirk, and he was split into two personalities, and they warred against each other in that particular episode. So the duplication, duplication episode shows that it has to be bits of information <laughs> removed. Well, that makes a lot of sense, because you'll see why when we go through this in a bit more. But even if you're moving bits of information, what about the soul, the mind, the memories? We don't really know. Uh, during Star Trek. It has nothing to do with lithium. Lithium is, is an element in group one. Nothing to do with that. Despite the fact we have this very authentic sounding name for dilithium, it means nothing. It can regulate, it supposedly it can regulate antimatter and matter, annihilation, because it's supposed to be the only form of matter that is porous and can contain 
um, antimatter. <laughs> Sorry. Nice try. A hollow deck. I'll immediately draw your attention to the last bullet. Hollow deck would give safe sex a whole new meaning. <laughs> and indeed, some of the characters have had problems using the hollow deck. You may remember some of the episodes uh, where that's occurred. Barclay, in, in particular, uh, had some problems on the hollow deck. But the hollow deck is great. You can relive memories. You can go places. You can uh, rediscover a lost love. Well, kind of. Um, the pad on your forefinger about one square centimeter, you've got 600 billion neutrinos going through that every second. Feel them? <laughs> so a solar neutrino can travel up to 10,000 light years one way before it ever hits anything. There's another one, this is, uh, is in the med bay sometimes. You see a DNA molecule rotating uh, with some numbers flashing up down the side, scrolling over there. It's, it's all completely meaningless. <laughs> but doesn't it look nice? <laughs> no, 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 we never, we never get to see it long enough on the screen, right, to know exactly what it is. So anyway, that's what it is. Sound. In space, no one can hear you scream. Where's that from? Alien. Yeah, Alien. Great film. I loved it. I, I love them all, actually. I'm kind of real science fiction geek when it comes to that. Sound waves do not travel in space. They travel through media, air, water, solid. They do not go through space. So there's a, a particularly good example here. Uh, a spaceship orbiting one of the planets blows up and from our vantage point on the ship, on the Enterprise, we see it and we hear it. What's even worse, we hear it at the same time as we see it. <laughs> and the difference in speed between sound in air and light is, is here. 340 meters per second versus uh, 300 million meters per second. I mean, you see this every day in a thunderstorm. You see the flash of lightning. And several seconds later, you'll hear the clap, the, the clap of the thunder. Well, that's the difference in the speed of light and sound. Because they were out of phase, they could walk through people and they could walk through walls. However, they were standing on the floor <laughs> and sitting on the chairs. And if you think about it, if the starship's going in the, in the right direction, a, a fixed direction, and they can move through walls, the minute the starship turns, they keep going straight. <laughs> into space. So, yeah, that brings me to the end. I'll just close with one comment case there's anybody out there that really wants to know how the Heisenberg compensators work in Star Trek, because this question was actually asked of, of some of the script writers, and I can give you the answer as to how the Heisenberg compensators work, how they get around that Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The quote is, they work very well indeed. <laughs> Thank you.